Welcome to the Land.MBA podcast, where we go deep into the business of land investing. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Land.MBA podcast. I am super excited uh, because we have a phenomenal guest today on the show. His name is Jaron Barnes. Uh, I've known Jaron uh, for over a year now. Uh, we've been talking. And uh, he's just got a deep background in various facets of the real estate industry. And I just want to go through a little bit of it so you can just see the breadth that this guy commands. Uh, he started out working in pre-foreclosures where he was knocking on doors, finding opportunities uh, f- for his employer in the pre-foreclosure market. And then he left there and he became a, a really significant person to build the bigger, pro- uh, the bigger Pockets brand, their brand, their podcasts, and everything that we know and love today about Bigger Pockets. Um, after that, he went on to work for a, a large uh, wholesaling company uh, where he, again, built their, their brand. He helped them build their podcast. I've been on that podcast, thank you, courtesy of Jaron, actually. And, uh, and then by the time he, he left there, he was responsible for selling 25 to 30 properties every single month. I mean, think about that kind of volume. Uh, since then, he's a very active and a very successful land investor. Uh, and because he hates to be bored and, and that, that just wasn't filling enough of his time, he's also now the creative director over at Ari Tipster with Seth Williams. So this guy's all over the place. Jaron, we are so delighted to have you here. Thanks for joining us. It's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, I do want to clarify one thing about Bigger Pockets. Josh uh, and Brandon had totally set up the whole thing before I worked there. Like, I, I don't want to paint any pictures. Like, I was solely responsible for their growth at all. I just had the opportunity to uh, run alongside them for about five months back in 2014 before they started building uh, the team that is in place today. So, at the time, it was just Josh and Brandon me and then a couple of VAs and, um, and software developers. And it was uh, quite the ride, but um, I learned a lot and I was trying to put out as many fires and holes as I could, but I definitely cannot take any credit for how amazing that platform is. All right. But, but I will say that you must have taken all those learnings and brought it to Simple Wholesaling because I know you were a, a significant part of that podcast. You were on the podcast. You were one of the co-hosts of it. Uh, yeah. I and- mean, I'll, I'll straight up take all, all the credit for Simple Wholesaling now. <laughs> 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 yeah. I was, I grinded there, man. I, I really helped. Um, it was a blast, but I really helped um, kind of put that company on the map, not in a boastful way, but just like you know, I was there to help originally brand them as a company. And before I started working there, nobody knew who Simple Wholesaling was. And by the time I left, if you know Indianapolis, buying, uh, investing in single family um, investment properties, whether they're flipping or, or holding, um, it's kind of synonymous with Simple Wholesaling now. Like you're going to run into, they're kind of the premier wholesalers in the Indianapolis metro. And that's, uh, you know, I obviously can't take credit for everything. We had an amazing team. Um, I mean, I look back at it and it was just like, it was like the golden years, you know, like it was, um, and we had a really good run there and it was awesome, but I definitely did a lot. Like my fingerprints are all over, all over simple wholesaling. Awesome. <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> so, cool. so, you know, I, I hear, I hear that number, you know, responsible for 25 to 30 sales a month. I mean, that is huge. Uh, and then you kind of transitioned out of that and then you went into land and, and, and you really never look back. Yeah. So what was it, you know, now you're so intimately familiar with both of those marketplaces. Why, why do you find land to be so attractive? It has all the perks of wholesaling houses with none of the drawbacks. So like, I mean, it's, um, you're dealing with far less competition. Direct mail costs is so much, um, so much more affordable in land. It's just, it's amazing because the land business, it's the only asset class that I know of where you have people that literally do not care about the property and want to give it to you for pennies on the dollar. When you deal with um, houses, there's just a lot more emotion involved. And you can definitely get deals, but I mean, as a contrast, you're spending big dollars if you spend $5,000 a month in direct mail costs as a land investor. Whereas in, in, um, in wholesaling houses, I mean, we were 
we were spending like thirty thousand dollars plus a month. You know, yeah. like to like you just the the margins are just like crazy. Like you're getting zero 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 point something um, response rate with with houses, whereas like with with land, like you know, it, you're you're typically a solid one two percent, which is incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. yeah, land is the. I mean, I've I've been exposed to a lot of what's out there in um, in the real estate game, and when it comes to real estate business models. Land, I think, is the absolute best. There, I mean, Seth just did a, a showcase of the deal where he bought a property for five hundred dollars and sold it for twenty five thousand, and that's not a typical deal, right? That's definitely right. a home run. But I don't know of any other type of real estate where deals like that exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. That's uh, like when I did a few years ago. It wasn't that good. It was. I could have probably asked more for it, but it was a, it was a deal I paid 500 bucks for and sold it for 16,000 in like a week. That's and, uh, awesome. It's, it's, it's actually my favorite deal of all time, even though it wasn't, it, it was, it was the best multiple, but not necessarily the most profitable, but I never had any communications with the buyer at all. They went on my website, they went out and checked out the property. They came in and checked out. That's awesome. <laughs> never texted, <laughs> never emailed, never called. So we got a little competition going here. Now, we don't know exactly how long Seth had to hold on to that property, <laughs> but when you make that an annualized return, you may have got him beat. <laughs> true. I held it's it for true. a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Although yeah. I, love the, I love the double close returns, you know, <laughs> zero days holding, <laughs> technically. Yes. Yeah, that at three, I think it was my third land deal I've ever done done, I had a double close that was really, really just insanely huge. So, uh, at the time I didn't, I thought I was going to be working at simple wholesaling for the rest of my life. And I didn't want to, um, create competition with simple wholesaling. So I just said, Hey, Brett, if I do any Brett Snodgrass is owner, simple wholesaling. I said, Hey, if I do any land deals, we'll just 50, 50 split them and I'll, I'll bring them your way. And, uh, you fund the deal and, and we'll, we'll go after it. And he had, um, a land deal that had randomly just come into the arsenal. And, and then I got a, a, a lead on, I think it was, I know it was, I feel like it was over 200 acres, um, but you know how it is with the, the fish stories, right? Like the fish gets bigger with time. So right. like, <laughs> like, I don't want to say something and then be wrong, but it was, I know total, it was a lot. It was definitely anywhere between like 150 to 200 plus acres, um, because it was combined with his parcel and then my parcel. And we, uh, we did a package deal for a timber company and, uh, and we did a double close and like, I made $38,000 in one deal. And it just nice. like changed my life, man. I was like, okay, land is uh, definitely for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not going to mention names on this, but it, these are crazy numbers, like $38,000. And you're only getting 50% of the deal, right? 50% yeah. of the profit. So that's only half the profit. Uh, we've got another guy that we work with who made $80,000 on one cash deal, uh, which, you know, is if you're playing in the higher number market, it's not as crazy as it sounds. Um, but I mean, to just be looking at those kinds of numbers and knowing, you know, how we run this business, it is insane. I mean, why would anybody in the long run want to choose a corporate career? I mean, I've been there. I did it for 20 years. I'm like, man, I worked my butt off so somebody else could get rich. I mean, I could just do this, you know, make 34,000, make 80,000. Come on. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's fantastic. I, I I don't know if I told you this, Jaron, but uh, there was like I recently partnered with a tax lien investor, and like I bought uh, three properties from him a couple of years ago. He gets land back. You know, he's the type of tax lien investor. He just wants the return, and he wants them to redeem. He doesn't want to take the properties back because he doesn't have the marketing systems in place and whatnot. So, I bought. He got one of my mailers a couple of years ago, and I bought three properties from him sold them. We, you know, did good business. So he remembered me, called me back and, and, uh, um, you know, a few months ago and said, Hey, I, I got a couple of properties. You interested in them? And they were in an area where they looked really nice, but it was, it was an area that had been, um, there's a lot of history where they, uh, this ski resort kept going bankrupt. So there was all kinds of delinquencies and, and bankruptcies in the area. So even though it's a killer area, it's turning around and all that, so I didn't, I couldn't find any data to comp them. And, and since we'd done business before, I, I called him and I said, look, I, I don't want to lowball you 
why don't we just partner on these? You bring the deal, I'll market them. When we sell them, we'll pull out your cost bases and split the profit. He's like, okay, cool, done. So we have we have two that two of them that we're closing the end of this month. So I have zero money in the deal other than my marketing cost, and um, I'll make sixty grand profit. Wow! <laughs> so you know, and those are not everyday deals, but the, the, but when you keep putting one fr- foot in front of the others, those deals come occasionally. Yeah, I will say though, w- one epic like one liner for the land business is it is true if you run the numbers that typically a land investor will not do a deal unless he's making at least a hundred percent ROI, if not higher. And you cannot say that about any other type of real estate investing. Like, I, I mean, we're dealing with smaller numbers, you know, yeah. to be fair, you know, we're yeah. buying for, you know, I don't know, five, 10,000 or whatever, but it's still like to think about that. Like, I don't, I don't even entertain a deal unless I can make over a hundred percent ROI. That's, that's crazy, man. Most people, when they hear about the numbers in the land business, they, they think that it. you're full of crap. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> More for me. Yeah. <laughs> I always tell people, I mean, the first deal I ever did was the worst deal I ever did. I got an 83% margin on it because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And man, I was depressed. And people are looking at me like, are you out of your mind? And my last corporate job, uh, that business, we had um, very consistent 30, 35% margins. And in the corporate world, that is sick. I mean, nobody makes those kind of margins in the corporate world. And here we are saying, I won't touch it if it's less than 100%. Yeah, it's right. insane, man. <laughs> right. It no, ruins you to other types of uh, real estate. Like uh, Seth has been um, kind of entertaining uh, storage units and he's been looking at some some other stuff. And he always comes back to that. It's like, man, like when you compare it to other types of real estate land just ruins everything because the deals are so amazing uh, compared right. to what else is out there. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, you can create cash flow. You know, I know you don't do seller financing. I do quite a bit of seller financing and, you know, you can create livable cash flow on notes so quickly, so much more quickly than, than, than acquiring rental properties. Although I think about eight to 12 months from now that, rental property is going to be a, a, a really good opportunity. Again, they're going to be bargain basement prices. Yeah. I would agree. As yeah. Well. And I think a lot of people a, are going to be out of houses. So yeah, I think there'll be a lot of uh, subject to opportunities and lease options. So you don't even have to, you know, get, get raise that much capital. But no, no matter how you look at it, I mean, to Jaron's point, it's, you know, the return of project A versus the return on project B. I mean, no matter how good it is over in the rental market, you still have all the other things that you always have to deal with, the, the termites Absolutely. and the toilets and all that kind of stuff. You've got people, you've got people that have to manage it. Uh, you know, problems arise. You've got to redo carpets and interiors when people turn over. You you know, you've got some periods of, of vacancy. You know, you just make the proper land. So that's it's uh, there. It's a great, it's a great, you know, there's just so many more moving parts. Um, yeah. So actually that kind of um, brings up a, a topic I wanted to ask you about Jaron. And that is, you know, I mean, with, with your experience and I, I've got, I've, I've done a, you know, about 20 fix and flips and a few wholesales. I haven't, I've been out of that for about five years, but um, you know, so I've seen that and I have a few doors, a few rental doors, um, and, um, what in your opinion, I mean, I think that, that land is a great additional stream of income for wholesalers and flippers. Um, and because I think there's a lot of synergies, they're already coming with some, uh, the mindset, you know, uh, the marketing portion, the very similarities for marketing for sellers, direct mail and things like that. What's your opinion on that? No, I 100% agree. That was one of the things that attracted me to the land business originally because I knew so much about wholesaling and the models were 80, 90% the, the same. The major difference, I think, between land and the way that I did wholesaling at Simple Wholesaling, because we actually took title to the property, closed on it, and then turned around and sold it um, to, to investor buyers. Uh, it's very similar to land. The, I think the major difference is I'm not typically selling to an invest an investor 
Um, and then sometimes you can sell to a developer or a timber company, that kind of thing. But uh, for me and my business, I'm typically selling to a retail buyer. Um, and the timeline is a, a little bit longer because of that. So I'm holding property typically between three and six months um, on average um, before I, I move a property. Um, I don't do terms. So I think that if you do terms, you can move them faster. But um, you know, that's probably the major distinction. Otherwise, direct mail... Um, talking to motivated sellers, the whole, the whole thing is kind of exactly uh, the same model as wholesaling houses and, and flipping houses, but it's a lot less marketing costs, a lot less competition. People are di- much more disattached from the property. So like, I love talking to motivated sellers as a land investor because like, I mean, I actually, uh, the last couple months I've been taking calls live during the day. So like, you know, if I get a motivated seller call and I'm not caught up in, on a podcast, or whatever, I'll answer the call. And they're the nicest people in the world. Even if you're you're telling them, you know, uh, I want to offer you an ex- super low ball offer. They're like, yeah, I'm sorry. That just doesn't work for me. But thanks anyway. I appreciate the effort. You know, it's like, I mean, sometimes you get people ca- calling and cussing at you and stuff, but compared sure. to houses, it's like, it's a walk in the park, man. It really yeah. is. Maybe maybe they're just playing off of you. You're a particularly nice guy. True. Dave, what do they like when they when they talk to you? <laughs> oh, they're idiots, man. Because I'm an asshole. <laughs> that's so <funny>. good, bitch. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, that's good stuff. Is it just me, or is it getting harder and harder to count on a job for our financial security? Who would have ever believed that we would go from the lowest unemployment in 50 years to 40 million people unemployed? Whether you have a great job and want to create a second income, or you're recently unemployed, you need to check out Land.MBA, your one-stop shop for land investors. Investing in vacant land is a proven business model that can help you build a reliable and scalable second income. Imagine a business where you love what you do. There's no limit on how much money you can make. You can operate your business from anywhere in the world with an internet connection. And best of all, you can never be fired or downsized. If this sounds good to you, Land.MBA provides everything you need to get your business up and running and delivering income quickly. You get education, an end-to-end video course, and optional coaching to help you get started faster and turn your energy into income. You get tools so you can automate and outsource the busy work and stay super organized. You get access to a thriving community of like-minded investors, which is a powerful way to share best practices and develop potential partnerships for growing your business. And finally, you get access to deal financing, so you never have to pass on a great investment opportunity due to limited funds. Our team has over a decade of real estate investing experience and has the knowledge and experience you need to help navigate any investing scenario. And with Land.MBA, we hold nothing back. Because there are no upsells, you get access to all of our combined knowledge right out of the gate. So don't wait to provide your family with financial freedom. Sign up today for Land.MBA's Soup to Nuts Land Investing Video Course. Just go to courses.land.mba and use coupon code FREEDOM to get 25% off. That's courses.land.mba and coupon code FREEDOM. And let us help you say goodbye to your J-O-B and hello to financial freedom. Why are you why are you so focused on the cash sales and and not so much on the uh, terms deals? I, for me, it's a matter of time um, because my main commitment, my main thing is Ari Tipster. It's kind of like a dream job. I've always wanted to work in kind of a senior position for an online community. Um, you know, ever since I worked at, at Bigger Pockets, like that kind of you know lit a fire in me under me, and I just really love. Um, the the nature of the work that I get to do at RA Tipster. So because that gets the majority of my time, I I'm a real 80 20 guy. And, um, I, I exclusively sell all of my properties through land specialized real estate agents, um, so that I can outsource dispositions, which is where a lot, most land investors spend the bulk of their activity. They, you know, they're on Facebook marketplace and buy, sell trade groups and, you know, dealing with buyer leads constantly. Um, and that's another distinction too. I think that it's almost flipped with wholesaling houses because, uh, you spend the bulk of your, your time with acquisitions and, and you have a good buyer's list. You're in some good, um, real estate, you know, investor associations or meetups and you build a buyer's list and it's pretty easy to move inventory um, in that world. So that's another thing that's a little bit flipped on its head. But for me, it's just, I 
I want to uh, spend as little time possible on my land business while still growing it and having it be doing um, a decent amount of volume. So, you know, it's hard to find agents that are going to be motivated to sell your property if you're selling on terms. Yeah. Sure, sure. I, I, sorry, Dave, I just want to, I just want to just follow up on this for a moment. Cause I, I think the average land investor that comes into this from one of the various schools, uh, thinks that, okay, I buy the property and now I've got to market it and sell it. That's just part of the standard process. And, uh, and so they're thinking, okay, marketing, how do I do that? Is it Craigslist? Is it Facebook marketplace? Is it land.com portfolio? Um, I think, uh, you use the term, uh, land, specific realtors. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe that wasn't the exact term you used, but it was something along those, those lines. And so first of all, just for the, for the benefit of the audience, can you define what that is? And then uh, can you define the pros and cons of doing your marketing and sales through one of them versus doing it yourself? Yeah, definitely. So I actually wrote a whole blog post about this at riotipster.com forward slash land agents. Um, so you guys can check out, you know, I actually interviewed my wife because uh, we were talking about um, this before the the podcast, but my wife is really the brains behind all the operations. She makes me look really, really good, but it's really her, like, you know, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, you know? Um, and, yeah. and she, um, I was telling her, no, Agents don't work. All the land guys that are doing it say that agents are stupid when it comes to land. We can't do agents. And she's like, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. And so um, what we ended up doing was we figured out this way where you can go to Zillow and you, it's pretty simple, but you go to Zillow, you look up comps of the subject property, and then you look for listings that look really professional. Most land investors, they have just aerial maps, but if you actually have a listing that has real pictures of the property, and then a really lengthy, good, detailed description of the property, those are indicators like, hey, this this might be a solid agent that knows what they're doing. And then what you do is you go there, you click on their Zillow profile, and then you can look at their past listings. And then if their past listings uh, has more land than it has houses, then you say, okay, that's another layer of like that. This seems like somebody who's very experienced in land. And then we call them up and then um, I actually provided like a full on like downloadable questionnaire that you can grab it uh, on that website or on that blog post rather at uh, riotipster.com forward slash land agents. Um, and we, I just vet them over the phone and just say, Hey, like, this is, uh, this is what I do. I'm a land flipper. So I, I buy, you know, uh, from motivated sellers. And then I try to sell my property within three to six months. I'm not trying to get top dollar. I'm trying to move inventory. So, um, would you be confident that you could give me a, a list price that would move the property within three to six months? And then if they say yes, and they, they seem knowledgeable and they, um, they, they don't seem to be salesy and yeah, yeah. I'm Mr. You know, yes, man. Um, cause yeah. you get that a lot with agents. Just most get agents, the listing, get the listing. Yeah. Get the you listing. gotta be super careful because most agents, even if they have no idea anything about land, they're going to be a land specialized agent to your face. You I know? can totally get you $200,000 for that property. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Dollar signs in the eyes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Which is why I like that question so much. You're asking the right vetting question, um, you know, and that drives the right, you know, the, the kind of information you need to make a good decision. Yeah, exactly. And the, it's an amazing system. There are just like everything, there are drawbacks and we'll get into those here in a minute. But like, uh, when you have somebody who is a, an expert in the market, I have boots on the ground when I'm doing due diligence. So like I, I have a, an amazing, probably my best agent is based in St. John's County and I can call him uh, St. John's County, Florida. And I can call him up when I'm running due diligence, say, Hey, what do you think I can sell this property for? And he gives me comps. So like I do my own comps, but then he verifies the comps that I'm seeing or if I'm seeing that there is very little comps in the area, he has access to, to different databases and stuff. And he can tell me, yeah, you know, there is this property that sold this property. You can sell it for this within three to six months. And that's a huge deal. He also will go by and walk the property before I, I buy it. And, um, cause sometimes, you know, like when you do due diligence and you look at the wetlands mapper, for example, especially in Florida, 
it might not be technically in wetlands, but you go there and there's like a puddle of water, like a foot of water across the entire property. So to have um, boots on the ground to go by another thing too, that's unique to Florida is like if cypress trees are on the property, it's essentially wetlands, even if it doesn't come up on, on the wetlands mapper. And the only good to way know. you're going, yeah. And the only way that you're going to be able to, to find that out is if somebody goes and looks at the property and walks the ground. So, um, you know, he, he's just, I found that it's like a huge, huge leverage point, uh, once you have them, but the, the big problem, the big question mark is actually finding them. There are times like I just bought a property in, um, Osceola County, Osceola County or, or something like that. Um, I don't know how to, they have really weird names for counties in Florida. St. Lucia. No, it's, um, let me look it up real quick. I'll pull up my property sheet. Um, O-S-E-C-O-L-A. Osceola. Osceola. There you go. That's the way it's spelled. (laughs) Well, sorry. You know, (laughs) anyway. So yeah, like I, I, um, you know, I got a property there and I couldn't find an agent that, um, was worth their salt. So I'm having another agent that's two or three hours away listed for me, crossing my fingers that, you know, they're going to be able to do a good job. But that's, that's the one drawback is finding good agents or um, if something happens to the agent, like, you know, what if they decide they want to retire or, you know, they, they fall <laughs> ill, they get the coronavirus or something, you know? Um, then, well, they get eaten by an alligator when yeah, they exactly. see property. Like, yeah, there's... <laughs> There's uh there's problems there, right? There I am putting all my eggs in one basket and it and it's based on the volatility of a human being. So th- what I'm giving up in exchange for um being kind of leveraged with my time and my effort cuz I'm outsourcing it all to somebody else, um I I'm giving up control. And so that's the major distinction lawyer. If I had my own web, like buyer facing website and I had a buyer's list and I, you know, handled my own leads and I did all that stuff in house, I have control over the properties. I have my own comps that I can, you know, uh, to look at from other properties that I've done and other buyers that I've, that I've dealt with. And so it, there's just, if I was going to be doing the land business full time. I, I, there's a strong chance that I would probably do a mixed strategy where I would use agents for some properties, but I probably would try to develop my own buyers list and, and have more control because if it's your livelihood, you want to be in the driver's seat. You don't ever want to toss it to somebody else. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I like that. So Jaron in with, uh, when doing targeted deals for, for agents, what kind of price point are you playing in. So what's a typical buy price and sale price for you? Yeah, probably anywhere between 6,500 to 15,000 is what we're buying at. Okay. Um, And so we're, you know, if I buy for 6,500, we're listing at least for, you know, 16, 17,000. Typically, you know, if, if well, I'm, I'm typically making with commissions and everything about $6,500 to $8,500 spreads. Um, so I, a lot of land guys probably wouldn't do the deals that I do because it's not a big enough deal for them. But right. I would rather do more volume. And being in a competitive market, I, I'd rather offer higher and actually get deals. Um, so I'm, that's, that's kind of one of my competitive strategies is I'm just like, Hey, you know what? I'm, if worst case I make $5,000 on a deal and then I can do three of them or four of them in a month, I'm totally good with that. Hey folks, my name is David Van Steenkist and I've been a real estate investor for over 10 years. I've used lots of different tools, but none of them has done for my business what Landspeed does. Landspeed covers every step in the land investing process from ordering mailing lists to marketing sales and closing the deal. What I really like though is it anticipates my needs. When I think, oh, I wish I had a quick and easy way to evaluate return on investment on a potential property, look no further, Landspeed does it. If I want to edit a deed after Landspeed creates it, it can do that too. Most systems just stick you with a PDF that's uneditable and you got to go back into the system and edit the fields and do whatever you need to do and it's a real pain in the rear end. Landspeed simplifies it. If I want to send one or five or even 40 neighbor letters at the click of a button, bam, Landspeed does it. Um, 
But even with all that inherent capability, you get access to land speed community, you get weekly mastermind calls, and you get the best mailing rates in the business with no volume commitment, which is freaking awesome. Because if I just want to pop one contract to somebody, I don't have to pay a buck and a half. I still pay the bargain basement rate. And on top of that, customer service is stellar, quick, and they just do a great job. I've been very, very happy, very pleased with it. Uh, and look, I've been running my business on land speed for over two years. So take it from me. If you're serious about your land business, then check out land speed at facebook.com slash land biz automation. That's land B I Z automation. And if you want a hundred bucks off, tell them you heard it from me, David Van Steenkist on the land.mba podcast. You know, it's not about maximizing profit on every deal. It's about selling it as quick as you can, turning your money over as many times a year as you can. It's the velocity of money. You'll make a lot more money by turning that money over, you know, five, six times than you will by turning it over two times, but getting a higher profit on the deals. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and you haven't, fa- I mean, I would imagine even at those price points, it's challenging to find realtors interested in uh, in those deals, especially the one yeah. that's two to three hours away. No, so that's that's the amazing thing about uh, land specialized agents, at least in Florida. I can't speak to other states, but um, they're they're happy looking at it from a volume based transaction relationship, right? So, like for them, they're in the long run. Um, and I, I mean, I've had agents sell properties that were a list price of like five thousand dollars, and they were totally good doing it. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I want to buy a property that I can at least list for 15,000, um, to make it worth the the agent's time. Um, right. you know, if it, if it's underneath 10,000, I, if I kept giving them deals, I think that they would get demotivated from, uh, from putting my deals as a top priority, but I want to keep them happy. Um, and are you I mean, paying I, 10% commission? It depends. Um, depends on the agent. Normally starting off, they lead with that on the first deal. But then after I've got some uh, repeat business with them, I'll negotiate down to six. So I, okay. I think it's typically like the guy in St. John's, he does six, six percent. So, so let, let's just put that in perspective. You could acquire a property and say, I don't want to do the marketing and sales. It's not my strong suit. And so you wholesale it to somebody else and you're giving up probably 50% of the profit margin, or you can go to a land specific realtor and give up 6%, 60% versus 50%. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty amazing strategy if you can get it to work, you know, and that, and that's the key yeah. is you got to know how to vet people because the agents will lie to you. <laughs> like that's the biggest, like buyer beware, investor beware. Like they will tell you that they are, uh, the world's great. I had one guy sweet talk me and sweet talk my wife, like, Oh yeah, I'm going to be your, your boots in the ground. I'm going to be this, this, that. And he was terrible. I got the listing with him and he didn't do anything for a month. So I, I like luckily was able to convince him to get out of the, the listing contract. That's another thing too. Uh, if it's a new agent, I would encourage you guys to negotiate with a three month listing agreement. Um, because, even if they tell you everything seems right, you just don't know until you get in bed with them. You know? Right. No, that makes total sense. Um, and something I've done before with, with agents and I know some, some people do uh, where they'll, uh, they'll give the listing, but the conditions are, look, we have our own marketing systems in place. You bring the, you bring the buyer, you get the deal. If we bring the buyer, we get the deal. So yeah. A lot of people. Yeah, do I mean, it's, it's, it depends. I mean, everyone's, I'm sure, is an individual negotiation, and the lower the price, the lower your uh, your bargaining their, power. Yeah, your bargaining power. I, I would guess that, and I don't know this, but I would guess that it would be easier to find these kinds of realtors in Florida because you have subdivisions, which you know, a single subdivision could have ten thousand quarter acre vacant lots, you know, more than entire counties out West. And so there's just so many of them and it's, it's attractive for all these people want to come down and plop a mobile home on it. Um, that they can, they could probably turn a lot of these things without, you know, breaking their backs. 
um, which is really what it comes down to. Cause you know, you can't, you can't do on a quarter acre lot, you know, for 15,000, what you would do for a single family home. So, um, you know, if you go out West, uh, you know, the, the, the dynamics are probably a little different. Right. And so I think that a lot of this has to go by the, the nuances of the market. Right. So, you know, if I was in Indiana, um, in order to, to bring on an agent, I probably would have to at least be having this price of like 25, 35,000, um, for them to even entertain it because it's just going to be harder to sell. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think in certain places, you know, I do a lot of business in Colorado and I think in, in certain places, uh, here as well. Um, cause they, it's, you know, sometimes the stuff's just way out in the middle of nowhere. You know, I think it's, I think if it's, you know, it's always subjective. If, if it's someplace that's closer in and it has the enough of a price point, then, you know, for sure they might be interested in it. Um, although you got any, What's happening with houses right now? I think a lot of agents will be interested in land because they're at they're doing nothing right now. Yeah. yeah, that I don't know why that reminded me, but going back to your conversation, that your your question about um, if land would be a good supplemental strategy for wholesalers and and house flippers, I 100% agree with that because. Um, I remember we turned away so many land leads when we were, when I was working for a simple wholesaling, like if it was land, we just was like, Nope, not interested. And we just like literally throw away money. And, uh, that's, that's a big no, no man. Cause like you can get those super, especially like info lots and stuff in like Indianapolis, you can get them super cheap. So, yeah. But can you sell them? <laughs> that's the problem. If yeah. it's the thing that you, that, I've seen guys make a lot of mistakes on with uh, infill. I mean, sometimes infill lots don't make sense if you get them for free because mm -hmm. it, you've got to make sure that the houses, the average house price per square foot is enough to be profitable for a builder to build a house and resell it and make a profit. And like I, I did some sales for some guys in Europe and they had picked up a whole bunch of properties uh, all of them were infill lots and at a glance, they looked really nice. Um, luckily they had them all on option and they didn't purchase them. But once I went through them all for them and the first thing I did, cause I did one and I'm like, this deal doesn't work unless the neighbor wants to buy it. This deal doesn't work. This deal doesn't. And then I started looking at them all and I get back to them. I'm like, guys, you couldn't give these properties away to a builder because the price per square foot in the neighborhood is too cheap. Mm. And so that's really something that you, you know, and I mean, if we're talking about cheap houses in some of those Indiana, Indianapolis neighborhoods, you got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't matter whether you're in Indianapolis, Florida, right. or, you know, wherever you do, you got to know your market. I mean, I, a lot of people will say, oh, land, it's just a numbers game. You throw a bunch of paper out there, then it comes back and you buy it and then you just flip it for two, three hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, that that's true. But if you don't understand your market, if you don't know what you're buying, who you're buying it for, and know that the economics on both sides of that transaction work, uh, you know, nothing is quite as easy as, oh, I'm just going to throw some paper out. I'm going to flip it over here. It's just not that easy. Uh, know, not, your, no. know your buyer avatar for sure. Well, and, and to that point, that was what was happening when I first started the land business in Indiana. And then I, when I moved to Florida, uh, well, I didn't move to Florida, but my, I moved my land business to Florida. Um, you know, it was a night and day difference. And it actually led me and Seth on a, on a I think, probably six to eight month uh, research journey as to trying to figure out market trends and, and market factors as what quantifies a good market from a bad market for land investors. And I actually wrote another, not to keep plugging all your tips there, but um, I did just write another blog post. Um, I don't actually know the URL, but it, it's, um, it's a, I can find it for you guys and I'll give it to you guys so you can drop it in the show notes. But yeah. um, you know, I, I walk through, um, my entire process when I do market research. And really the biggest things for me are job growth, um, looking at future potential job growth, as well as the last uh, 12 months of job growth and um, population growth and, uh, and crime. 
Um, you know, I just try to keep it real simple, but based on those metrics, you can use a website called bestplaces.net, which is a uh, kind of a one-stop shop. You can get all of that information and a whole lot more in one centralized place, which is really nice because your alternative is to go to a bunch of really obscure government websites that are not very fun to navigate there. And, um, and so like once you're, you're there and you pull all the data for, you know, let's say Florida or Colorado or what have you, you can just sort uh, on, on Google Sheets or Excel, um, you know, Z through A, and you can see the top performing, um, the, the top growing markets for those, for those metrics. And then, um, and then you can select those counties. Now you need to couple that with affordability. Like if, you know, like we take Florida, like obviously Orange County where Orlando is, is popping right now, but that's really expensive. If I'm going to be buying, you know, land in, in, in Orlando, um, so, you know, you have to couple it with what you have capacity for, but if you use those metrics, you can really, really know exactly where the path of growth is. And if you buy there, I, I think you have a much higher likelihood of, of selling. Cause I was buying, I was using the whole, um, you know, a, a good market is a population density of less than a hundred people per square mile, uh, an hour to two hours outside of a major metropolitan area. And it's not sufficient, man, because like there's that, that just doesn't really work. Like I was buying in rural areas that match that and I wasn't selling property. And then going back to Indianapolis, um, why I actually brought that up is because there was um, one time I got a, a lead from a wholesaler in kind of a, not like super ghetto, but it was on the West side and it was like, uh, very cheap. And it, it was like, I, I was kind of rolling the dice. I was like, Hey man, if you want to buy it, I'll try to sell it for you. And we can see what, what, you know, and we can 50, 50 it. And we sold it in like two weeks and, uh, and it moved quick. Like, and the, in Indiana, I would have, I definitely did deals. I think I did probably around 10 deals or so. Um, and within the the year and a half that I was there. Um, but it was always hit or miss. It was like, I'd, I'd have one month that was amazing, lots of traction. And then like, I'd either have crickets on direct mail or I'd, I want to be selling property. And it was just, it was very hit or miss. Whereas Florida has been very consistent. Like it's a system. And I think it's because inherently uh, land in Florida is more desirable. It has an international buyer space, you know? Yeah, yep. for sure. So if you could only, if you could only choose a County based on one single metric, what would that be? Probably population growth over the last 10 years. What about you, Dave? I would choose it based on activity and I may choose it based on the population growth in the nearby major Metro, because you can have, lack of population growth in, in counties where you don't have a lot of jobs and you don't have a lot of people living there or, or put, making their full-time address there, but they have cabins there, they have second homes and they have recreational properties there. So population growth in, a, in the county that you're investing can be very deceiving. Depends where you're at. You know, I do a lot of stuff out West. Um, and so yeah, I would say, you know, population growth, but I would edit that to the major nearby Metro. Um, and then I, like I want to, I want to look at activity, you know, I want to look at that. There's, there's a lot of sales going on and that you don't have a huge number of for sales versus solds. You got fairly at least 70, 30. I like yeah. that. That's good. What about you, Howard? Well, my, my big one is always activity. You know, and, and, and so I want to know, and so what I do is I'll look at the previous three years and say, what was the, of those three, what is the average number of vacant land transactions that occurred in the county? Um, that is the market. Nothing I'm going to do is going to increase the size of that market. So that market has to be big enough to take on, you know, whatever that I want to do and, and, and lead me to believe that there's a buyer's market. But it, I'm just going to, I'm going to go off that one because David already said it. So just so we can add another one, <laughs> the other one would be, I, I also want to know who's buying. If all of the buyers and sellers are local, I'm probably not interested because the way this business works, I need to have an unfair advantage in my knowledge of pricing. 
Otherwise, it's really hard to get the good distress deals and you know and negotiate well on both ends. So if I'm in a county where the vast majority of vacant land transactions are between locals, I'm at actually at a disadvantage. They know they understand the market better than I do, and I probably would go look for something else. So I want to give a little pushback just to keep things interesting on market activity, because I know that is uh, a lot of times the golden standard, but. I feel like uh, it's hard to gauge market activity because if you were to look at Landwatch versus Zillow, for example, Landwatch has a ton of listings that aren't on Zillow and vice versa. So yeah. how do you, I mean, I guess you'd have to pull from several different sites and then get an average of you know, the three or whatever, but that's a lot of work. Like, I mean, do you guys, what is your best tip, I guess, for for doing, uh, to, for assessing market activity, because I've always found it like we, we in our write-ups for our tips are like, we definitely show you, Hey, look at days on market on Zillow and all this stuff. But the reason why I don't put as much weight into it, um, as others is I just feel like, uh, if I go to any one source, I'm not getting a full picture of market activity. You're absolutely not. It's a really good point because, you know, in certain areas, um, and I think Florida is a great example because you have some of these, you know, high density subdivisions, which have a lot of activity. You're going to see uh, more Zillow stuff on a um, in an area like that. But if I go into uh, some of these big counties in Colorado or uh, and and Arizona and other places, I may not see that much on Zillow. Like especially if I'm looking at 10, 20, 30, 40, 80 out. Uh, acre lots. I'm not going to see very much of that on Zillow, but I'll see a lot more of that on Landwatch. So, you know, truthfully, it's as much art as it is science. You know, I, I don't have an exact metric that says it has to be this percent or that um, because your, your, your data is a little bit of this. At the end of the day, Everything comes down to, to data and the quality of the data. Yep. You know, and, and so there's a process. And, and this, is, this is the hard part of the business. I mean, if you don't come from a strong data background, um, it's, you know, you got to learn it. it it's, it's a bit challenging. You know, not all, not all the information you're getting is of equal quality. Um, when I look at activity, um, I, I do use Zillow days on market just because, not because the number of days is is any is a particularly meaningful uh, metric, but what it allows me to do is it allows me to have the same metric and apples to apples comparison of county A versus county B versus county C. And so, if one has an average days on market of you know 180 and the other one has uh, an average days on market of 30, I know that this one county is going to be moving properties a lot faster than that county. Yeah. But where I really get my where I really get my data from this is data tree. So I just, which is pulling it directly from the county. And that's why I look at the average of the last three years, because that's telling me the number of properties that actually sold. And that to me, the number of properties that actually sold is, is the market size. And I mentioned, meant to mention that that too, because I'll do a combination of three Zillow land watch. I may look at lands of America, but I'll also look at, at data tree for sure. I like to use data days on market though, when I'm comping, um, you know, usually, you know, that's where you pick out the outliers real quick. You're like, wow, that's a lot. And yeah, look how long it's been on the market. Although you still have to look at that. It's subjectively because they, it might have a low days on market, but they just put it on, you know, so you don't know. And that's okay. I mean, the trick is, so like, if you use days on Zillow, you can't just say, all right, you know, here's my criteria. Give me you know, the average days. First of all, average is the wrong metric. Average is a terrible metric. Um, I, I strongly recommend people use median, not average. Um, so, so average basically says, give me all of them, add them together and divide it by the number of data points that I have. Median says, this is the point at which half my, half the properties are below and half the properties are above. Um, but the other thing that I do is when I put my, my criteria into Zillow, I'll say, I only want to see properties that, um, have a days on market of one year or less. Because if something's out there for five years, that is that is an outlier. It's going to screw all. My, it's going to skew all my results. So by putting everything in one year, I'm kind of putting everything into an apples to apples comparison again. Yeah, for sure. 
One thing for the audience that is very unique to uh, the land space is there are some incredibly smart people in this world. I don't know for how small we are, like in terms of, you know, uh, people who are active land investors compared to other asset classes. um, I am shocked at the amount of technology and uh, like it attracts a lot of engineers and software engineers and, um, data guys, because it's just a, I feel like you, you can't, you have to, you have to kind of master that piece in order to thrive in the land business. Whereas with houses, um, because it's such a localized market and most of the time you're there present, you can kind of um, get by just kind of flying by the seat of your pants. But like, because most land investors are out of state or if they're, even if they're in state, they're far away from where they live. Um, you, you have to get acclimated to, uh, to assessing data. Like I was not a, a data guy, but now I'm, I totally geek out on data all the time. <laughs> totally. I mean, well, you know, I, I, I say this a million times a day, but you know, the, the cool thing about the land business is we buy a piece of land that we've never seen in a County that we've never been to from a person that we've never met. And then we turn around and flip it to somebody else that we've never met all from the comfort of our own home. Yeah, which may be our house, an RV, or a beach in Thailand. It doesn't really matter. Which is absolutely mind-boggling. Yeah, it's but amazing. if you are going to successfully run a business like that, a desktop business, um, what is it that you are using to make all of your decisions on? It's got to be data because you don't actually you don't walk in the property. Yep, for sure. And uh, you know that I love that you know when you talk about a beach in Thailand. Um, my uh, one of my 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 prize student, uh, uh, coaching student. He uh, he started this from Thailand. I think we had like the first one or two coaching sessions when he was here in in the states, and then he went over to Thailand for a very extended vacation. And he started his business up and ran it from there. And then uh, I think came back here like six months later. But I mean, he just crushed it. He's coming up on what eleven months, and yeah. he's making more money than me. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's killing it. He's totally killing it. So yeah, totally. Well, I think we're getting c- close to the end, David. Did, did We, we got to make sure we, we get all suck every last bit of value out of Jaron before we let him go. Is there any other questions you had? Are there any other uh, questions? That you you had? know what? I, I had one, one kind of trick question for you. Yeah. What's it like working for one of the biggest gurus in the industry, the God we call Seth Williams? <laughs> I don't know if he would identify as a guru. Um, I know. I, I, he probably hates that. That's why I said it. <laughs> yeah. He'd probably be like, um, no, nah, man, honestly. It's um, more annoying than somebody who's like, that's that, that good and that humble. It's just annoying. <laughs> yeah. And what's crazy is it's real, man. That's the, that's oh, the crazy know. part is that. I love that you know, guy. There's, um, you know, I've been in the space for a while, man. Like the kind of my, my career path has been really weird. It's been that cross section between content marketing and real estate. So, uh, you know, I've seen the good and the bad and everything in between. Um, I'm getting flashbacks on some people that are really bad, but I won't, I won't uh, name drop them. Um, only good, only good. (laughs) But like, (laughs) <laughs> but the thing is with, with Seth is like, I've seen people put up a front, like in their, in their branded personality, right? Like, I, I mean, some people, they're totally different behind the podcast, you know, in real life. Um, Seth's not, man. Like Seth is actually one of the few people I've met in my life who truly is as authentic as you can get. Like what you see truly is what, what you get in person. And, um, I've seen him, uh, have opportunity to get, uh, like angry or to, I've seen him get, have opportunity to get upset with, you know, like people talking trash or doing this or that. And, you know, we're getting back to him and I've seen him consistently every single time, anything like that, where it would be justified for him to, you know, like be more human. He's like, Nope. I'm not going to do that. And we're, we're still going to promote them. We're still going to love them. We're still going to like, you know, keep doing what we do. And, uh, it's amazing, man. It's, uh, it's really stretched me as a person to, to have his example in my life. Cause I actually like, you know, he, you can have a very successful business and actually be a very strong moral human being at the same time. You know? Yeah. I love yeah. that. I love it's, that. You know what pisses me off about Seth though? What? 
<laughs> jealous of his hair. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> me too. Guys, like, I think he has like, I don't know, eight years on me or something. And uh, I have no hair. That's why I always rock a hat. And yeah, yeah, yeah. His hair yeah. Is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, see, I'm using my chrome dome strategically for lighting. So that's why I'm not wearing my hat. <laughs> I love it. It, it. it creates a nice contrast to the black background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, good. Hey, um, so Jaron, why don't we uh I think we're pretty much at our at our end. We really appreciate you coming on. It's been uh special. And uh, but uh tell people uh, I mean you've already, you know put out the uh, website a few times, but tell people how to reach out to you if they want to know more about you. Yeah, man. Probably the easiest way is just send me an email, uh, jaren at retipster.com. Um, and for the record, guys, it's uh, we got we actually updated our logo because people yes. kept calling it Retipster -E <laughs> or REI Tipster. Look, like big block. It says R-E-R -E period E period Tipster. So yeah, re. Yeah, I'm guessing re that was yet another example of your value add to that in to that business. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I was uh, I, I did I was like Seth. People keep getting our name wrong, man. And he's like, I know. We should do something about. It. I'm like, yeah, we should change the logo or something. Make it very, very like literally the periods are have my fingerprints on it. <laughs> Howard, when are we getting hats, man? I know we got to do that. I, I was, I was looking at Jaren's hat and I'm like, in my mind, the, you know, the, 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 the gears were turning. We got to do that. Yeah, man. <laughs> we're, so uh, good. I, I, I don't want to say too much cause it might not happen, but we're experimenting with apparel, apparel, um, at our tips there. So if we get some decent hats, they might come on the, the our tips or store in the future, but no guarantees. It might not happen. But well, we'll, we'll trade it. We'll, we'll, we'll barter hats. I'll send yeah. you one using, you know, yeah, that'd be great. Absolutely. <laughs> that was good Jeff. thanks so much buddy it's been great chatting with you you're you're a star and we uh, we really appreciate you yeah right. thanks man it's been a pleasure guys we hope you enjoyed this episode had a bit of fun and walked away with some actionable insights that you can apply to your business dave and i have got some great content and interviews planned so don't forget to rate and review and of course subscribe to this podcast on itunes google play stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. If we mention any interesting links or tools, you'll find them in the show notes. To learn more about Land.MBA, visit our website at, wait for it, Land.MBA. See you next time on the Land.MBA podcast.